Good morning, Lighthouse family. Please bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father, we kneel before you this morning first to say thank you for another day. While no one else knows what to do or what to say, you are unmatched in your power and your wisdom. Please give us guidance in these perilous times. Bless your servant this morning. Speak through his lips as though it were you physically in our midst. Give him the message for each of us individually as well as collectively. Now, this is the confidence that we have in you, that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And because you hear us, we know that we have the thing that we've requested. It is in the unmatchless name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Thank God. Amen. Good morning, Lighthouse family and friends. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. i like to welcome every single last one of you to our Sunday morning worship service. Typically, we title it on the, on, the, on, the, on the media, Sunday morning worship with Pastor G. I'm just a servant who the Lord is using, but i like to welcome you all this morning to our Sunday morning worship uh, with the Lord, with the Lord. Um, I am humbled to be here before you all on this morning. Um, I do not take it lightly. Um, and I just thank all of you all for tuning in um, and spending time with me on this morning and allowing me to spend time with you in your homes, with your family, as we discuss the word of the Lord. Uh, thank you, Lafonso Robinson. Thanks, Unc, uh, for your prayer uh, this morning. Um, I thank the Lord for you um, and who you are to me and for your service. Service, um, this morning um, and fellowshipping with us here at the Lighthouse on the Pike Church. We thank you for all of your support. Um, this morning, this morning, if you will, um, the word of the Lord you can you can find in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, chapter four, and we're going to discuss verses 19 through 24. This morning we will be in the Gospel of John, chapter four, verses 19 through 24, and again. And I will be reading from the ESV, the ESV, um, chapter four, of the gospel of John, verse 19 reads, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for today. Lord, for you have saw fit to wake up us, your people, on this morning. Lord, likewise, you have compelled us in our hearts that we would come together, even if it's virtually, um, in our homes, Lord, that we would join one another in spirit, Lord, to hear your word. So, Father, by your spirit, I ask that you enlighten each and every single one of us, Lord. Expand our hearts, Lord, to receive more of you, Lord. Expand our spirit and our minds to receive more of you, Lord. Make known to us what it is that you would say to us and what you would have us do, Lord. Make known to us um, the mind of God, Lord, so that we can not just be puffed up with information, Lord, so that we can be more like your son, Jesus Christ, your living word. So, Lord, as we gather on this morning, um, Lord, I ask that you remove any and all distractions. Um, Father, I ask that you be a comforter to those who are in need of comfort. Lord, I ask that you would be a healer 
to those who are in need of healing. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would be a deliverer to those who need delivering. Father, I ask that you would be any and everything to everyone that in any need that they would have on this morning. So Lord, and always, always as a request in this house by your spirit, Lord, upon hearing your word on today, let your spirit resonate in us, teaching us to be better doers of your word and not just hearers alone. So Father God, I thank you and I bless you. And I ask these things in the name of your precious son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. Verse 22. Three, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Effective at 5 p.m. on March 23rd, 2020, the governor of Maryland, as well as other governors and leaders across America, shut down their states by ordering the closure of all non-essential businesses. These directives were given in an effort to stop the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Even though I understand what was taking place and why they made those choices. Unfortunately, the church and other places of worship was considered a non-essential business and our doors were for forced closed. It has now been some four and a half months later and our country has opened back up. The church doors are allowed to be open with restrictions, however, there has been no resolve on fighting the virus. Therefore, most of the religious community, including the Lighthouse on the Pike Church here, we've decided to keep our doors closed. The decision by the state officials and now church leaders has completely changed the Christian worship experience of the past. And I personally believe that it has likewise changed the worship experience of the future, the days to come. As a result, a lot of church, a lot of church goers have presented the question, how can we worship? How could we worship God if we're not allowed to go to church? In today's lesson, Jesus explains that God has no limits and because he has no limits, neither does his people. I titled today's message, No Limits, No Limits. In the Gospel of John, chapter four, your Bible subtitles it Jesus and the woman of Samaria, a very familiar text, a very familiar text. I've heard it preached many and many of times by many of different people through my tenure and being a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've heard it preached from many a different ways. I've, I've heard the drama behind the message. I've heard this woman uh, be ridiculed about her lifestyle and what people have perceived her to be. I've heard them talk about her or focus heavily, heavily on the fact that Jesus tells her that she have had many of husbands and the man that she's with now is not her husband. I've heard her called from anything from a floozy to a whore in the pulpit. However, no one ever really stops and focuses on the fact that this Samaritan woman was one of Jesus's first, was one of Jesus's first, if we, in regard to the Gospel of John, one of the first people to go and witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this, 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 this text um, is covered at some 
some 30, actually some 45 verses um, that's covering Jesus' encounter with this woman and how he changed her life and the men of the town of Samaria. This morning, the Lord has not drawn me um, to any of that, but he points he directs my attention to these uh, some six short verses here um, with Jesus and this Samaritan woman having a discussion about worship. Likewise, I would like to direct your attention. Now, I also I also would. I um, encourage you all to go back and read the text, read chapter four of the Gospel of John in its entirety. But for today's lesson, if you will, we're going to discuss these short verses. And here it is that Jesus says to the woman or the woman says to Jesus, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And now this is after this is after Jesus tells the woman to go and call your husband for she was asking him questions about this water, about this water that Jesus says to her that if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, that you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The, the woman looks at Jesus and him not having anything to draw the water and, and confusion. She, she honestly says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and this well is deep. So where do you get this water? Jesus being the master that he is, he's actually baiting her and pulling her in this conversation. She goes on to say that, are you greater than our father Jacob? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Showing that the Samaritans and the Jews have some relations. For Jacob, for Jacob, she calls their father. He gave us this well to drink from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus says to her that everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again for this woman found herself traveling in the heat of the day alone, day after day, week after week, month after month, going after a water or going to draw water from a well that would never have the ability to quench her spiritual or her inward thirst and her inward thirst. How many of us find ourselves thirsty for something and thirsty for someone or some place or some being or some status in life just to find ourselves getting there and find ourselves still thirsty? Jesus says that I, the water that I give you or the water that I will give you will become in you a spring of water welling up to eternal life that you will never thirst again. Brothers and sisters of the Most High God, now this isn't my message for today, but since we're here, I just need to give you some context, and this is another preaching point for another day, but I'll give it to you today. That all of us have found ourselves thirsting after something, someone, some place, some idea in life, and these things will never, they will never, they can never, ever, fill us for that deep calling or that deep thirst inside of us has been placed there by God the Father himself. And the only one that can quench that thirst, the only one that has the ability to quench that thirst is the Lord Jesus himself. And if we continue, if we continue with these um, 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 unrealistic expectations that we put on other people or we put on other places or we put on other things that we put on other ideas just to find ourselves unfulfilled and unsatisfied. You have to know that the Lord Jesus says that if you would ask him or if you would ask me being him to give you a drink that you will never thirst again. The woman in verse 15 says to him, well, sir, give me this water. <laughs> She says, so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again. I submit to you, I submit to you right where you are, right in your living room, right in your kitchen, right in your dining room, right as you roll over right now. I know somebody is there late and they're rolling out over bed and they're rubbing the crust out of their eyes. Why don't you be like this woman if you find yourself thirsting after things that will, that has never quenched your thirst? Why don't you be like the woman right where you're at? Right where you're at. Right where you're at. Admit to yourself that nothing of, none of this has ever worked. 
And why don't you call out to the Lord, like the woman said, and say, Sir, or the Lord, please give me this water so that I will never have to come here and thirst again. I'm going to move off of that. That's another preaching point for a whole nother day. But some of you, some of you, I know, I know, some of you, all of us, we need to ask Jesus to give us that water so that we will never thirst and find ourselves coming to this well again. Now, look at Jesus baiting her in. Jesus says to her, and now I put this commentary in here knowing this already. Jesus says to her, go and call your husband and then come here. Go and call your husband and then come here. And the woman answered to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying that I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. And she admits, or he says to her, and what you said is true. Ladies and gentlemen, when the Lord says something to you, when the Lord says something to you, and in this particular case, Jesus was baiting her, but baiting her in a good way and getting her to admit and getting her to admit or getting her to confess her shortcomings or shortcomings is just a way that a clean way of saying her sins, her sins. The Lord is baiting her and getting her to admit to him her sins. And likewise, when the Lord says things to her, when the Lord says, Adam, where are you? When the Lord calls you and asks you, where are you or what are you doing? Or when the Lord tells her to go and get your husband, he already knows her situations. And he's not doing it to embarrass her. He's not doing it to condemn her. He's not doing it to put his finger in his face. And, and he's, not, he's not the God of like we make Santa Claus where he's making a list and checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. No, he already knows. And when the Lord says these things to us, he's saying it so that we can admit not only to him, but primarily to ourselves, the situations that we have ignored for so long. And he wants us to admit it to him so that he can free us from these things. But as long as we try to hide, as long as we try to conceal these things from him, in a sense, we kind of cross his hands. Because he desires to set us free. He desires to give us water that we will never have to thirst for again. But first we must admit, we must confess to him where we are. And the woman says to him, I have no husband. And Jesus says to her, what you have said is true. Now, here we are in our text. The woman says to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet, meaning that you see and have the ability to tell me about all of my life. And later on, and we're not covering it in this text, the woman goes back to the town and she tells the men to come see a man who has told me about my whole entire life. That's what a true prophet is. A true prophet is the mouthpiece of God. And he and or she in today's time, if the Lord wills, enables him or her to be able to speak for God himself to us. Being able to reveal and see and say things that no person would have ever known but God himself. Oftentimes they're able to look and see the deep things inside of man and reveal it to us. Because remember, it is the Lord speaking and it's not the prophet of the day that's promising houses and cars and all of these erroneous things that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God just so that you can give an offering of some sort at the end of his message. No, 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 no. True prophecy is spoken through man by God himself. And it is for the purpose of his kingdom, and not you and I's financial gain. So because this man, this man Jesus, who she has no idea of who he really is, and she addresses him as sir, she says, sir, I perceive that there's something different about you. You have the ability to see into my life and tell me about it. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And since you are a prophet and you obviously know something, well, answer me this. Verse 20, she says, well, our fathers, how is it? How is it is what this is really saying. How is it that our fathers worshiped on this mountain? But you, you, meaning that you Jews, not you as in him, but there, is, there has been a line or a history. There's been a history of, 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 
of hatred, if you will, or dislike and separation between the Jews and the Samaritans. It's not what we're here for today. That's another Bible class. But John tells us a little bit about this way back, way back in verse 9. For he tells us that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jews have absolutely no dealings with Samaritans. That is a matter of fact, because Samaria set in between a Jewish man's travel between Galilee being northern Israel and Jerusalem, southern Israel, one would travel extra hours to go around Samaria so they would not have any dealings with the Samaritan people. I'll tell you right now that just in your Bible study that you will find out that there's a relation, there's a familial, a family relation between Jews and Samaritans, for Samaritans are partially Jew. But we see here, John tells us that for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So she says, tell me this, how is it that our fathers worship on this mountain, but you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Now look at Jesus' response. I love it. He's baited her in this question. And now we see the power of God. We see the characteristic of reconciliation, how God has always desired to reconcile his people unto him. Look what Jesus does now. He's baited her into this conversation, and now he's reconciling her and the Samaritan people, and he says to her this here, Jesus said to her, verse 21, woman, believe me, believe me, believe me. Don't believe what you heard, but the Lord says, believe me. The hour or the time is coming. The time is coming. The time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. He's saying, woman, the time is coming where there will be no limits. There will be no limitation. Worship will not be limited to a particular place or a particular geographical location. For heretofore, the tradition was, she just told it to you, that our fathers told us we have been taught from birth. We have been raised. We have been girded in this belief that we worship God, the father of Abraham, on this mountain where our father Jacob gave us these wells. But you Jews say that no, 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 that that's the wrong place. That true worship only takes place in the temple in Jerusalem. <laughs> You and I have been raised and girded and believe that we only can worship, we only can worship in this geographical location of an address of wherever our local churches are. And we've used Bible text, we use Bible text for I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That Old Testament psalm where it was actually talking about entering God's temple entering God's temple. But we fail, we fail to read the text and to Corinth where Paul writes the letters to the church in Corinth and says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so now if we were able to put the two together, why don't we let us go into the house where the Lord dwells, which is inside of us. For Jesus, Jesus tells his disciples later on in the gospel of John that I am in the Father. He is in me. You are in us. Together we were in you. He tells us that wherever I go, you will be there also. Back to the text. Back to the text. I don't want to get distracted. He says that the time is coming or the hour is coming. The moment in time is on its way where neither worship will take place on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. People... Ladies and gentlemen of the Most High God, I am not suggesting that when we're talking about corporate worship together, that this is what we're doing. Because, yes, we are kind of figuratively together if you're watching right now, but we're not physically together. And I know we can say that we're spiritually together. But the point of what I'm getting at, that when it comes to true worship, when it comes to true worth, to worship, true worship. That it has absolutely nothing to do, we can abstract from this text, that worship has absolutely nothing to do with physical location. Worship has nothing to do with physical location. Or, let me put it to you this way, worship is not limited to any physical 
location. Jesus says, believe me, believe me, the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. People of the Most High God, <laughs> well, we'll see that he'll say later on that now the time has come, but people of the Most High God, the time has come where obviously we will neither worship God at our physical church building locations, whatever address it is, whatever state you, whatever city that you're in, the time is now here where we're not worshiping in these buildings. We're not worshiping in these buildings. So we're not worshiping in Jerusalem, nor on the mountain. Now, look at verse 22. He says, he being Jesus, you worship what you do not know. Uh-oh, we need to stop and talk about that. But we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Now, let's park right there. and Let's just have a little Bible study or a little Bible fun facts or a Sunday school, whatever you want to call it. Let's just, let's just have a little study here. Because obviously Jesus was not talking about that the Jews or the Jewish people or the people of Israel themselves understood. Because it was the Jews that said that true worship took place in Jerusalem. And we see all throughout Jesus' journeys that his major opposition was from the Jewish people, those who did not understand what it was that he was saying and or doing. So it could not have been. It could not have been for they didn't even know that he was the Messiah. They had not accepted that he was the Messiah. So it could not have been that the Jews themselves understood where salvation come from because he was referring to himself. He and the Father alone understood that salvation came from the Jews, not that the Jewish people themselves would be salvation, but he was only referring to himself and him being of Jewish descent is the reason why salvation comes from the Jews. It does not make the Jewish people. It does not make the Jewish people superior to anyone else in the world. It does not, and from a religious standpoint, it does not make the Jewish people superior over Christians. It does not make the Jewish people superior. The only thing that gives credence to this text is that yes, we can acknowledge from our Bible and from understanding that salvation did come from the Jews because from his earthly standpoint, Jesus was Jewish. Therefore, he's saying to the woman that you worship what you do not know. But we, referring to himself, Worship what we know. The Lord is telling us something here that every single last one of us, please hear my voice, that every single last one of us, regardless of how long that you've been saved, regardless of how much you've studied, regardless of what schooling background, educational uh, background that you have, it does not matter. At its bare bone, we all worship what we do not know. We are this woman in the well. She just had a whole theological dissertation with him. She's given him Jewish history. She's even told him, and she's, and, she's, and she's let it be known that she studied her history. She understands that Jacob, that Jacob, yes, the trickster, that Jacob is her father. She tells you that she come from the lineage of Jacob. She comes from the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> She understands her religious and she, she understands her family tree. She understands her history. She just had a theological conversation about religious history with the Lord himself. So she is studied. She's understands. See, we've given, we, 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 we've taken this woman and we've made her all type of dirty things who's messing around with people, husbands, and we've called her whores or whatever. But she understands her religious background. She understands her religious history, something that most of us do not know. All we know is that we go to church. You can say what you want to about her, but she is able to have and articulate a conversation with the Lord himself about what it is that she believes. The Lord is drawing her. It is my personal belief that the Lord is enjoying this conversation with her. And now he's telling her that, yeah, you know all of this stuff. Likewise, we know all of this stuff. And at day's end, in comparison to what the Lord knows, he tells her that you worship what you do not know. 
You worship what you do not know. And we need to humble ourselves and we need to admit maybe, just maybe, it's just a suggestion that, Lord, I don't know you to the capacity that I thought I did. Lord, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I have no clue what it is that I'm doing. <laughs> Lord, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I have I, I, the, the more that I know and the, or the more that I learn is the more that I recognize how much I don't know about you. That's a mature stance. See, see, most of you all know me. Yes, my back, my educational background. Yes, I've gone to Bible college and undergrad. Yes, I have received my seminary degree. Yes, I've, re I've also taken postgraduate courses. Yes, I brag sometimes about how I love studying the Bible. Yes, I've been able or afforded the luxury of traveling to Israel. Yes, I've had instructors to, instructors to teach me Greek and teach me about Hebrew. I have all of that. And here's the one thing that I've concluded today. That the more I learn about him is the more I recognize how much I don't know him. And that's a place of maturity to be able to recognize and to be able to identify within yourself and admit to others. That the more I learn about the Lord, the more I realize how much I don't know. And Jesus tells the woman, when it comes to worship, when it comes to worshiping the Father is what this conversation is about. Because remember, that's what it came to. She said, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews say that we, worship, that we should worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus tells her, woman, the day is coming. We're neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. What? Here's the subject of the conversation. Will you worship the Father? So here at verse 22, he's saying, when it comes to worshiping the Father, you don't know what you are doing. When it comes to worshiping God. I didn't write it. It's here in red. If it's here in red, then Jesus had to say it, right? <laughs> no, John didn't write the letters in red. The, 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 the authors of our Bible did that so that we can distinguish that it's the Lord speaking. He didn't have red ink or black ink, but Jesus said it. He says that when it comes to worshiping Father, the Father, you do not know what you are doing. I know that just pricked, that just, that's messing with somebody's pride right now, but I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to take my time before I move past that. When it comes to worshiping God, you do not know what it is that you are doing. None of us know what it is that we are doing. I know, yeah, you, you can't tell me that. I didn't tell you, Jesus just told you. It, when it comes to worshiping the Father, based off of your, your, based off of your traditional worship, based off of your knowing or your knowledge or your history or the traditions that you have in place, where does it say that worship is restricted to these houses? He says, where does it say? Where did you get this idea that worship was restricted to the mountains. Where did you get this idea that worship was limited, if you will, to Jerusalem? Where did you get this idea? She says, or he says, you worship what you do not know. But we worship what we do know. Because watch this, salvation comes from the Jews. Were we talking about worship or was we talking about salvation? <laughs> We're only able to worship him because of salvation and he himself is salvation for salvation comes from the Jews that's what he says 23 Jesus doesn't just leave us in ignorance he just told he doesn't leave her in ignorance he didn't he didn't just because that is what it is you worship what you do not know not knowing something is ignorance it's to be ignorant of something. He's telling her when it comes to worship, you're ignorant. He's telling us when it comes to worship, you're ignorant. We're ignorant. I love verse 23 because it starts off with the word but. Meaning that the Lord does not leave us in those places of ignorance. Or as I talked, spoke about last week or the week before, the Lord does not leave us in darkness. He does not leave us blinded by the God of this earth. <laughs> He does not leave us blinded in man-made traditions. Verse 23, I love it. Just one word, but. 
he provides a way out. So you've been worshiping in ignorance. But the hour or the time or moment is what this means. Is coming, as he has already said, but watch this, is now here. Why is it here now? Because Jesus is here. Because heretofore, you did not have the ability or you did not have access to the Father. Prior to the Lord Jesus, neither you and I have access apart from the Lord Jesus. We do not have access to the Father. So if, in fact, we have not accepted him, if, in fact, we have not submitted ourselves to him, what we have been doing is not worship. Because, see, some of us have accepted him. So, yes, we are saved. I'm not, I'm not questioning whether or not you saved or not. That's between you and God. Only God can make that particular judgment. He knows whether or not you've accepted his son or not. But some of us have accepted him, but not all of us have submitted to him. Because when Jesus died on the cross, after the ultimate or the final sacrifice was made, when the lamb was slain, the Bible tells us that the curtain was ripped in the temple. Remember, only the high priest had the ability and and only once a year to go behind the veil and put sprinkle blood on the altar for the sins of Israel. But when Jesus died on the cross and blood was sprinkled, that was the altar. When the blood of the lamb was sprinkled, now the veil was ripped, now giving man access to God. So Jesus now tells her that the hour is coming and is now here because he's here. (laughs) He was referring to that the hour is coming because he had not died yet. He had not went to the cross yet. However, but because he is who he is, he's saying that it is now here right in front of you. Watch this. Well, now because of me, because of him, true worshipers. We'll worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, let's look at this word true. True worship or true itself was not a contrast or a comparison to that which is ultimately false. No, no, because that would suggest that the woman herself, all that she had done, all in her sacrifice, all in her submitting to God would have been, he would have been saying that it was false and it was not true. He is not using the word true in that, in, in, in that light. What he is saying that now true worship is now that which is perfect. Meaning that at best, at best, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ completely leading us, which would also call for responsibility on our part, where we are completely submitted to him and holistically following his leadership. At best, what we've learned to do is mimic what we've seen over time. Not saying that it was wrong, just imperfect. So a lot of us have learned how to do church. And we call it worship. We call lifting up our hands, let's worship him. So we lift up our hands. We've, we've, we've differentiated the fast songs in church and we call it praise when we're excited. But when the slow songs or when we were talking about secular music, so when the ballads would come on, <laughs> when the slow songs would come on, those that had the ability to slow it down a little bit and speak words of love and adoration, and not so much party and celebration, but the words that would speak about intimacy and it slows it down. We call that part of the service worship. So we got the fast and the celebratory songs, that's praise. But when we want to talk about love and intimacy, we call it worship. <laughs> that is what we've been taught. We've been taught that when a person cry, a person wails before the Lord where he or she is worshiping, if a person bow down, which is a meaning of worship, they're worshiping. But when a person is celebrating, they're giving him praise. These are things, these are things, these are things that I've been taught. These are things that I picked up just by spending time in church from the times when I walked through the door. Likewise, we've learned these things 
And at most, I'm not saying or I am not suggesting that we were wrong in celebrating the Lord in our manners. In those manners, some churches sing hymns, more traditional hymns. Some churches sing hymns that's based off of their denominational beliefs. Some don't sing based on any denominational beliefs. Some like to rock, some cry, some clap, some wail, some scream, some dance. <laughs> Some speak in tongues. Some don't believe in speaking tongues. But we all call it worship. We call our Sunday mornings worship service. As if, as if, if we're rendering service, that means that we should be doing something. Which means that worship, if we're talking about removing the limits, Today's message is no limits. Worship itself has absolutely nothing to do with the day of the week. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the day of the week. It has absolutely nothing to do with the physical location, geographical location. There is no limits to what it is that worship. He says, for you are ignorant. You worship what you do not know. <laughs> but the hour, the time is coming. He's, gonna, he, 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 he's bringing us into light. He's bringing us out of darkness and is now here when the true worshipers, and again, that's not as if we were false, just imperfect, where the perfect worshipers, watch this, it is a continuing futuristic action will, he says, the time is coming and is here, watch it, don't read past it. Because it's important that you read it in the sentence structure, the time is coming and is now here when... There's a day coming when the true worship, when the perfect worshipers, they will worship the Father. They will, not maybe. They will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I like to, I like to give a little silly story. I haven't made a story about my dog Ziggy um, in quite some time, who in the beginning, he quite frequently made, <laughs> made it to my sermons. When I walk through the door, when I walk through the door, um, my dog, my dog is so excited to see me. Even if it's just been two hours, if I've left him in a house where I've been gone all day, um, my dog, he is so excited to see me. And when I open the door, he growls at me. He growls at me. And I have, for most of you all who don't know, I have an 85 pound uh, pit bull, bull master mix. So when he growls, it's a deep growl. And to some, it may sound like, oh, my God, this dog is growling at you. No, it is not a ferocious growl. He is in pure excitement that I just walked through the door. He lets me know it. And he growls at me. It kind of sounds like Chewbacca from Star Wars when he does it. And then what he does, his tail is wagging crazy. He goes and he, and he finds something, uh, a toy or something that I've given him. That he, that, that, that he treasures and he takes his toys and he moves them all throughout the house and sometimes he just lays on top of him. But it means something to him because his master gave it to him. <laughs> I'm going somewhere with this. And Ziggy will go and find that most precious thing to him. And he comes to me and he, and, 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 and to know and to know the characteristics of, of how animals or dogs communicate is fascinating when you pay attention to him. He doesn't walk to me upright with his head up and his chest out as if he's the alpha in the house. No, he goes and find what I've given him and he gives me this deep growl and when he approaches me, he puts his head down as if he's bowing before me and he gives me that thing that is most precious to him that I gave him. I don't care how many times I leave out the house, he would do it over and over again. And he trusts and he waits with his head down or he looks up in, the, in expectation for me to give it back to him. He goes and get his most precious thing that he has and possess. And he gives it to his master who gave it to him. Understanding, trusting in, believing, and he's committed to the fact and waiting of knowing that I'm going to give it back to him. And that's what worship is. Worship in itself, it just means, it, it just means, it literally means the word it was derived, it comes from like to kiss the hand of the master and it's like a dog. Why did, it's like a dog because animals get it. 
I'm not calling us animals, but that's what worship means. It is to submit itself. It is to, and then in some other places, it's to kiss, it's to kiss hands, it's to fall on the knees and touch the ground with the forehead to one or something that is greater than the thing itself. It's the lowest state that one could posture him or herself in. Now, that's literally, but figuratively, the Lord is asking us to render our hearts to him. It's like the story with Ziggy. Ziggy takes his most precious possession in, in his excitement when the master shows up, when his master shows up, he gives it to him. It's what the Lord Jesus did. The Lord Jesus, it's what God did. If we, if we just look at how God desires to relate to his people, for God so loved the world, don't miss it, that he gave, <laughs> he gave his only begotten son. The Lord gave his most precious possession to his people. And then what did the son do in return? Because the son loved the father. And the son loved what the father loved, his people. He, in return, gave up his most precious possession, his own life. And likewise, the Lord is telling this woman at the well that when it comes to true worship, it's limitless. There's no limits on worship. There's no geographical and location on worship because worship has nothing to do with the place. It has everything to do with the posture. Because the hour is coming and is now here when the true worship, perfect worship, will worship. <laughs> true worshipers, perfect worshipers will worship. Perfect worship will worship the Father in two places, if you will. And the first, he says, the first place you're going to worship the Father is in spirit. Why? He tells us the next verse, he says, before God is spirit. <laughs> God, God is the void of matter. He's not like us as human beings. I know, I know we like to make God a person. We first by calling God a him. And I'm not suggesting that he's a her. I'm just saying that God is spirit. And spirit does not have any human attributes. But, well, Pastor G, well, why do you say that when the Bible gives the, the, God, the Bible gives God human attributes? The Bible says in Genesis that he walked in the cool of the day. The Bible says in Isaiah that the earth is the Lord's footstool as if he has feet. And if he walks in the cool of the day, then he has legs and feet. Psalms tell us that the eyes of the Lord is on the righteous. <laughs> The book of Leviticus talks about how he sets his face against evil. He tells Moses that I'm going to put you behind a cliff in this rock because if you see my face, the day that you see my face, you should surely die. The Bible writers have given the Lord God human attributes. It's a theological term that we call anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism, big word, big word. But it just simply means to attribute human form or personality to God. To God, we, 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 and it's great because it describes, it describes God's relationship to us. However, it becomes dangerous when we see those and we limit God to those words because the author is nothing, doing nothing more than trying to relate or describe God in a way that's relatable to humans. So, and in most cases, whenever God did any of those things, it was showing God's attributes on how he was giving something. So when the Bible says that he was the many-breasted one, that means that he's providing nourishment like a mother would to her children. And because he's not limited like humans are, he's many-breasted, meaning that he has enough milk and nutrient and supplement for all of his people at the same time. God is not limited to human form. You and I have limits as far as us being in this flesh. But he says, Jesus says that the true worshipers, the perfect worship, will worship God in this location in spirit because God is spirit. Therefore, 
and the part of man is spirit. We have to worship him in that place where there's no limits. So if we worship God in spirit, we don't have to be in a building. If we worship God in spirit, we don't have to be on a mountain. If we worship God in spirit, we don't have to be in Jerusalem. We have the ability to be where God is. It's in spirit. It is not at 5904 Marlboro Pike, District Heights, Maryland. It is not whatever address your church is. It is not whatever address your home is right now. That true worship, perfect worship, will worship God at this address. Write down this address. Everybody get a pen, put it in your phone. Write down this address. You ready? S-P-I-R-I-T. See if your phone can give you, pull up the GPS. True worship, perfect worship will be, take place in spirit. Now, not just in spirit, you got to go another place too. You must worship the Father. True worship is worshiping the Father in truth. Uh Uh-oh. And when we worship him in truth, Watch this. See, we have to worship in spirit. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that no man knows the mind of God except for the spirit of God who searches the deep things of God and then reveals it to us. So it's the spirit of God that reveals us the mind of God. So we must worship him in spirit. We must worship him where he is. And then we must do it predicated upon truth. And the first truth is that we need to find out what his truth says in his word. No, not what tradition says. Not what denomination says. Not what your denominational doctrine says. Not what your pastor says. Now, granted, you got a pastor, whoever he or she is, that's teaching you truth. I'm saying that you must worship him not only in spirit, but in truth. But the Bible tells us that the spirit of truth will lead us to all truth (laughs) and all understanding. For the letter kills, but it is the spirit that gives it life. So we must first do our due diligence. Uh Uh-oh, here we go. Study to show yourself approved as a workman that need not be ashamed before God, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to become students of his word and then become doers of his word by the leading of his spirit. And it is in those two places that is the address for where worship takes place. Worship only takes place in spirit and in truth. The rest of the text tells us for the father is seeking, is seeking. The father is now, if we say seeking, he's going after. The father is looking. This is the type of worship that the father looks for. He he looks for those who are doing it, those who are laying themselves prostrate, those who are willing to give up their most precious possession, which is themselves that ultimately he's going to give it back to us and that is the day when the Lord Jesus comes back and now we're going to trade in this what is imperishable I mean this what is perishable for that which is imperishable the father is seeking after such people to worship him verse 24 tells us the God of spirit and those who worship him must worship him at that location, at that address, and that is spirit and in truth. And I close, I close with this. I close with this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul tells us, Paul tells us, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, to present your bodies, just like the Lord Jesus did. Now notice, he did not say a dead sacrifice. He says, present your bodies bodies or present yourselves as living sacrifices. Here's the thing that we miss that we because it becomes gruesome in our thinking, but we really don't we really don't don't look at what happened on the cross. Jesus was not dead when he was placed on the cross. The lambs, the animals that they took to the tabernacle was not dead. They were taken 
to the altar alive and they were slain alive. Jesus was put and tortured on the cross alive. And Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, don't be some religious freak and take myself, take my words out of context. I am not telling you to go cut and slice yourself. No, that is not what it is talking about. The word is literally talking about that while you're living here on this earth, offer yourself, give yourself to the Father. And yes, figuratively, we have to die so that he may live in us. He says, present yourselves as bodies of living sacrifice. Now watch this. We cannot present ourselves any kind of way. I know, I know we've been told, come to Jesus as you are. <laughs> and in the beginning, we should. <laughs> but the Bible also talks about how we're being prepared to be a bride for the groom. So the Lord cleans us up. The Lord dresses, he, he, he literally washes us. That's what we see these sacrificial washings in the Old Testament that a man had to wash himself. He had to purify himself in the mikvah, in these bathing pools, before he entered the temple of God. And then they had to dress themselves appropriately before he would enter and then make his sacrifice to the priest. And likewise, Paul tells us that now we are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, but we can't do it just any kind of way. We have to be holy, meaning that we had to be set apart. Likewise, the, the families had to pick the choicest animal and they had to set it apart from the rest of the flock and they nourished it and raised it all year. This one animal was set apart from the rest of the flock and it was the best and they just didn't give them any old scrunchy animal. They chose the best one and they set them apart and they prepared them all year for them to travel to Jerusalem and present the animal. The Lord, Paul tells us to present ourselves holy, to present ourselves set apart. We have to set ourselves apart for the Lord God. So no, we can't just come to him any kind of way. And he says, you do it. You, you, you offer yourself holy and acceptable to God. God has to accept it. We can't just come in with this mindset that because I give it to him that he has to accept it. So because I worship or because I, that the Lord has accepted, no. Present yourself holy and in the posture of what is acceptable to God. Paul says, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And watch this. He says, which is your spiritual act of worship. Lord God, I thank you for your word on today. Lord, I thank you for your spirit who is still bringing life and correction and direction to your people. Lord, it is my prayer that those who are listening on today will hear that we must set ourselves apart. And not only must we still set ourselves apart and not just for any reason, as if we're just waiting and waiting and waiting. No, Lord, we're setting ourselves apart so that we may be acceptable to you. Lord, it is my prayer on this morning that anybody who is listening to this service today that have concluded because they've been secluded for so long, for the past four and a half months, that they have not been able to go to their place of worship, Lord, it is my prayer that you show them to their place of worship. Lord, it is my prayer on this morning that you would teach all of us to not put limits on you, thus limiting ourselves. For your word says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where your spirit is, Lord, there is freedom. And there's freedom in not having any limitations in you, Lord. But first we must figure out for you. Jesus says that we worship what we do not know. Lord, we do not know you in the manner in which we should. So by your spirit, Lord, continue to reveal yourself to your people. Continue to draw us closer to you, Lord. Continue to take us to where you are. For Jesus says where he is, we will be also. So it's not that we're not there, but Lord, please continue to remove the veil from our eyes so that we may see you and know you a little bit more. Lord, that is my prayer on this morning. 
And I ask these things in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. If there's anybody who's listening on this morning who do not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died for your sins, that you will be saved. Will that be your commitment? Will that be your confession on this morning? If anything that I've said today, know that it is not me. I'm just mere human, just like you, but maybe it's the spirit within me, the same spirit that is pulling at you. Jesus says that no man can come to the son unless the father draws him. If you feel a pulling, if you believe that Jesus Christ is real, that is the Lord revealing his son to you. Would you accept him on this morning? Would you accept him on this morning? That is all I have for you all today. Remember, every Thursday, Every Thursday. No, there is one more thing. If you're looking for a church, if you're looking for a church, if that was your prayer, that you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, don't just stop right there. Now, find yourself a Bible-believing church. Whether it's this church or another church or someone else, connect with someone. Because, yes, we are a body. We're many members, but we're one body. And a member or a piece the hand cannot be separated from the body and say that it's still part of it. Find you a Bible-believing church so that we can strengthen and encourage one another. That's that. And then, two, if you would like to join this church, if you would like to be a member of the Lighthouse on the Pike Church, regardless of where you're at, thank, thank the Lord for technology. We're not gathering in this building, but you can be a member of this church, too. But if you are, if that is your desire, if you feel the Lord pulling you to be a member of this church, send us an email to info at the lighthouse on the pike.org that again that's info at the lighthouse on the pike.org and someone will uh, get back to you expeditiously and then lastly 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 um, if you would like to give to the mission here at the lighthouse on the pike church please visit our website at the lighthouse on the pike.org again that's the lighthouse on the pike.org and click the giving tab. Remember, every Thursday at 7 p.m. across the hall in the classroom um, our, is our Bible study as we uh, continue to make our way through the book of Acts. Through the book of Acts this Thursday, I believe we will be at chapter 19. Um, so we're almost wrapping up. It's 28 chapters in the book of Acts. So um, I don't know what we're going to study next. As a matter of fact, that's a good idea. Uh, if there's a book, if there's a book that you would like to study uh, through, uh, send us an email. I'm willing to take suggestions and we'll go through it and see uh, what the Lord is leading us to. But I like to make this, again, this is not just about me. This is about so we all can grow. Um, if there's a particular study, a particular book that you have interest in, why don't you send us an email to info at the lighthouse on the pike.org um, and let's see what our next course of study would be in our Bible study series. Um, I believe, oh yeah, so every Thursday, 7 p.m. Bible study, we're almost, we're making our way toward concluding the book of Acts. And then again, every Sunday at 11 a.m. right here in the sanctuary, uh, you can meet me here and prayerfully the Lord would meet us here as well. That is all I have for you today. I thank God for every single last one of you, every single last one of you. We're thankful for the Lord God. Um, we're thankful for your return home, Marcus, um, and the Lord healing and touching your body. We give the Lord credit and we are, are thankful for you. Now unto him who is able to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forever. Remember, God has no limits. Now and forever. Amen. Grace and peace to you all.